Okay, so uh, welcome to this session. My name is Christian Walsh. Uh, I am the Content and Digital Director at MRS. Uh, the session is called Brand Purpose, What's Measured, What's Missing and What Matters Most. It's a very broad ranging topic uh, and I've got three fabulous panellists to join me to, to, to delve into that topic. Um, I'm going to do the introductions and then we'll get straight on with questions. So we've got Kate Reeve, uh, Head of Customer Insight, Digital Transformation at RBS. Hi, Kate. Hi. And then we've uh, got Didier Rockart, Managing Director, Global Analytics Lead for Customer Insight and Growth at Accenture. Hello, Didier. Pleasure to meet you, Christian. And Sarah Deco, Lead Research Manager, Data and Loyalty at Co-op. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hello. So thank you all for, for joining me. Um, just before we start, um, we're going to be alluding to some research um, that uh, MRS performed over the summer. Some of the people watching it might have actually uh, completed the questionnaire. Um, it was a client side questionnaire uh, and um, we, we it was a joint project with Accenture and it, it really explored brand um, purpose uh, and how to measure it and um, uh, one of the findings, which I think is where we want to start this conversation, which perhaps is unsurprising, was that seven in 10 client side insight professionals felt that purpose uh, is uh, vital um, and very important to their organization's long term business objectives. I don't think that's a surprise. Um, what's perhaps surprising is only four in 10 respondents felt that they uh, believe they work for an organization that's already measuring brand purpose. Now, that was regardless of the size turnover of the organization. I thought it would be a good place for us to start the conversation to see how that perhaps chimed or not. Um, I'm sure not within uh, the two uh, uh, organizations, organizations we've got represented here, but whether you think that might be representative uh, from what you hear in the market and from your experiences, is that a surprise to you? So, um, I'm going to ask um, Sarah first um, at the co-op. How does that sound to you? Is that surprising? No, I don't think it is really a surprise because I, I suppose we're an organisation. We are a true cooperative, so we aren't accountable to shareholders. We're accountable to our members. Um, even we find it complicated, expensive, controversial to measure that. Um, and if we find it tricky, I'm not surprised that other organisations that are accountable to shareholders find it tough to do. Um, I think it's really easy for us to say as well that that sits at the heart of what a business does. But actually, life gets in the way. Businesses are accountable to a lot of short term deadlines. And a lot of these things involve long term thinking, long term measurement of impact. Um, we've also found as a team that we've had to lean into different partners and different ways of working to actually get under the skin of some of these issues. And it is it's hard to quantify. It's hard to put a number on a lot of this. Um, and, you know, we're still working it out. And I'm sure lots of other organisations are, too. Um, so, yeah, it's not a surprise. And I think we're all on a journey with it. I think uh, uh, people watching this might find that quite reassuring, Sarah, um, you know, that, that even an organization, you know, perhaps with the, the investment that you've got in, 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 in insight um, is, is still going to find it a, a challenge. So Kate, from your perspective at RBS, can I ask you how you, how, how you respond to that, those findings? Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and I think, I think for, for some colleagues kind of brand purpose, it is quite a new concept um, and um, and and I think working out how to measure it, how to build it into your plans when you've got existing workload and you've got existing initiatives. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it's quite a difficult concept to get your head around. Um, I think what one thing that we do is, is very much kind of you kind of embed it in the decision making internally, but the external perspective on it. Um, and what that that really means for, for for customers and for the business, that's a lot harder to get to. I think that's something that we're, we're all still working on. 
Didier, you work with a range of of clients. Um, you know, your your and thank you for that, Kate. Do, do, do Kate and Sarah's responses surprise you, or again, is is this something you're used to hearing? No, it's something I completely echo, and um, everybody is on the same page that this is something that's not only important to themselves, but also increasingly so to their consumers and society in general. But at the same time, it's incredibly hard to define what it is and especially how to measure it because it's been biased for a long time on sustainability topics and increasingly it's expanding into much more social purpose and other things that are equally important and figuring out especially as Sarah said earlier and as Kate said as well is um, how do you measure this long term this is not a quick fix this um this needs a lot more work to, to define what it is and then to find those measures and set up the tools to do so. Thank you. And, and, and Didier, you were you were involved uh, in this, this um, research project that I've mentioned. Um, was there anything else that came out of that that particularly surprised you or intrigued you? In yes, of- actually, thank, thank you for asking, Christian, because building on what you just said, um, a lot of the organizations agreed that it was important. They also agreed we by no means are we in any position where we are currently able to measure this or have any idea how we're measuring. But in the same breath, everybody who participated in the research said that they felt they were doing a lot better than their competitors. So there was an inherent belief um, across the board that they were outperforming whoever they were competing with. But then what they also said was that a minority, actually only a third, believed that their consumers would actually know what their brand's purpose was. But in the same breath, they also said, we are sure that 50% of those consumers share the values we share as an organization. So there is a leap of faith Mm. where there is a feeling we're doing, maybe we're not doing as great as we want, but we're doing better than the rest. And uh, we're not sure that our consumers get our brand purpose, but we're pretty sure that when it comes to our values, about 50% of them align. So it's going to be particularly interesting to see whether those perceptions have any value in reality or whether they are wishful thinking. But it was interesting to see that confidence um, amongst the respondents. Yes. Yeah. Again, um, Kate and Sarah, does that sort of surprise you? What what Didier's just said in terms of the, the other things you've heard from from that research? Not at all. No, it, it, it all kind of uh, all sounds very familiar. It rings very true from my perspective. So uh, let's move on to 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 what what we're measuring and and what are the right metrics? Because um, you know, when I was researching for for today, I I saw those. An early criticism of of certain case studies that had had used metrics, um, specific metrics that tended to look sort of more at the marketing um, objectives, the awareness of certain campaigns, the awareness that it created for the organisation, um, perhaps even the impact on 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 their 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 revenue, and and so there's lots of good internal metrics that we're using to measure potentially or some organizations are using to to measure how brand purpose is is adding to the brand equity of the organization but perhaps not the criticism was they're not going far enough to actually look externally about the um how their actions are driving um change within the society that they are you know purporting to represent that that often the purpose is describing a, a particular motivation um, that they want to um, engender, and, and they're not actually using those metrics within their organizational measurement um, in terms of the impact on, on people uh, uh, and customers. So does that, do, can I ask, um, Kate, does that sort of feel a fair criticism from your side? I think so. I mean, I, I think it, it's kind of, it's kind of wrong to regard this as brand or marketing measurement. It's It's completely different. Um, and I think, you know, again, maybe I'm doing brand research a disservice, but kind of asking kind of how certain words associate with brands, clicking through from comms, success of marketing campaign, you know, that that's that is it's purely a marketing measure. What this has to be about is outco- outcomes. It's got 
ought to be outcome driven. And actually, for me, the, you know, the type of frameworks, the type of measurement that is most relevant is the type of, of evaluation models that you use in the public sector. So, you know, what is the evidence that this investment is having the outcome that we're trying to achieve? Um, and I think you've got to work it through from scratch from that perspective um, and build in the right set of metrics. So if, you know, as our purpose is around helping people, families and businesses to thrive, then you've got to have a set of metrics which reflect whether that is working, whether that is happening, what percentage of businesses of your customers are failing, who, what percentage of, of customers are going into debt, what support and resources are they using, how are we actually you know, moving people kind of out of those situations, supporting them, giving them the help they need. And how do they feed back on the experience that they've had in dealing with us when we've when we've been kind of managing that that or supporting them through that process? So I think that you know there's there's a whole set of, of different kind of metrics. It's not again, it's not easy to do. Evaluation frameworks aren't easy, mm. um, but you've really got to work through what what is actually going to prove that we're delivering on this. And and those metrics, I think, are key to that. And presumably, that's that's part of the challenge of short term sort of impact and, and measuring long-term impact which is going to you know any societal change you're not going to see instantly so um, absolutely uh, yeah, those, those things don't happen quickly and also you know we only have to look at, at what's going on at the minute you know what's happened in the last couple of years there's a whole set of, of other factors driving that impacting that so it's not just about what we're delivering it's about the market the context the other issues that, that customers are facing Sarah, how does this how does this work for you at the co-op? Because I mean, we're, we're all aware of the co-ops, you know, in, in, I think we're all quite probably more intimately aware of the co-ops objectives than, than many other organisations. So how, how does that work from your side? Yeah, I think there's there's two things Kate was talking about that I was just going to pick up on. Actually, one was um, I think brand tracking, you're absolutely right. It's it's almost not an out metric as far as we're concerned but it is an important part of how we kind of suss out how we're doing um and we have actually changed our brand tracking provider and the way we do brand tracking to hold ourselves to account against a really different set of purpose-led brands because um you know it's fair to say we would probably do quite well against the market in terms of purpose but actually we want to hold ourselves to account on a, a more difficult benchmark than that um, and as a member owned organization that's really important to us because we want people to understand what we're about so we can bring in more members and the members of the future so I completely agree with you, Kate, but I guess from our perspective, it's a bit of a lever that we're trying to pull to help us understand how we're doing. The other thing I was just going to pick up on there and 100 percent agree with is this short term, long term and also understanding the scale. So lots of the things that we do and the lots of things that we commit to aren't going to change. You know, they, they are going to take a generation potentially to change. They're not going to change overnight. So I think we have to be really realistic with ourselves as an organisation and with um, we are a business. We have to make a profit as well, um, even though it is a profit with a purpose. We have to make sure that we are managing expectations in the right way about what success looks like in this space. Um, and a bit of testing and learning as well, to your point, Kate, as well on what we measure um, and looking outside of um, outside of our business area for how we might do that so yeah i think there's a lot of commonality there there's an interesting um point you make about the benchmarking which goes back to didier your your you know the research that you you pulled out there saying that people are perhaps benchmarking themselves against the wrong organizations if 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 they all if they feel they're doing so well um didier did any of how, how did all that sound to you from from a, a broad client perspective so again it, it it resonates perfectly we we keep seeing the same themes popping up where um everybody is trying to figure out is this something we we track on a more close to the ball everyday kind of way or is it more of a long-term play and it's finding this balance between what are some of the things we can do with our portfolio right now to at least hit some of the notes that we are seeing our consumers care about more versus how are we long term going to slowly shift our brand's purpose or our business to be more purposeful as a whole. But um, very much at this point, they're looking left and right. And it's almost anecdotal examples where one organization gets one thing right and then it has an impact. I'll, I'll give the example of Patagonia, who just said we're going to give the company back 
to the environment, which has a huge positive impact on their brand purpose and image. But obviously not every organization will follow suit, but they are looking for people doing initiatives and finding the leaders and then say, how can we somehow contribute in a similar manner? Moving on, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the metrics and, and in terms of the actual data um, that, that we're exploring, um, Didier, you're, 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 you're an expert in the field of data analytics. Um, and um, uh, I wanted to just get a sense from you of, of changes or trends that you've seen in terms of how clients are um, approaching data and perhaps the questions they're asking of it. Is there a, has there been a change lately in terms of that kind of sophistication um, or, or, or approach? There has, um, and, and it's it's a great question. So what, what we see is we see two things that are shifting. Traditionally, the easiest way to obtain data, especially for something that is as complex as brand purpose, we would go into field and, and ask people. We would do surveys, panels, and it would all be um, effectively prompted. Today, we, we all know that there is social, there is search, there are reviews, there are tons and tons of unprompted data. And what we see organizations is to turn more and more to that data source, especially when it's something quite difficult to define. They are li they're listening to not the general population, but a subset of very mindful consumers who are really engaged with their brand or their category and trying to figure out what do they find meaningful? What is brand purpose to them? And sometimes this leads to quite some surprising findings where one organization who, um, I'm not going to mention the organization, but their products, um, ultimately, when you use them, you throw them away. And they were very concerned about the sustainability impact. But then when they started to engage and see how consumers interacted spontaneously about it, they saw that there was actually only a small subset of consumers where this mattered. And the large majority had absolutely no issue with this being a throwaway product. So it's it's not always evident um, to go into the field with a framework or with a preposition. So they use this type of data to say, maybe we can learn from our consumers how they define purpose and then follow as opposed to trying to lead. And that's a very interesting shift because when you look at more traditional marketing, you will go in with assumptions and hypotheses. Here, sometimes you go in completely blank and you let your consumers tell you what they believe you sh should be doing to be purposeful as a brand. It's a really good point because I think, you know, we, we it, it could be very, you need to presumably understand what your customers or potential customers genuinely, it's the say-do gap, isn't it? It's It's really where their priorities are and and we all assume that we all care about the, or, or many of us care about the environment, but to, to what extent, how much will it actually affect our, our behavior? And, and, and do we, do, do you start off with a purpose and the hope, hope, hope it chimes, or do you, do you refine your purpose? Do you refine your comms around that purpose? Obviously you do, but to what extent do you understand your customers genuine, um, uh, how genuinely important it is to them? Sarah, how does that, how do, how do you understand that? How do you get to that sort of granularity of understanding? Yeah, well, actually, I was just going to pick up on something that was just mm -hmm. raised as well, because for us, it's not just about our customers. It's about our customers, our members. Also, there's 60,000 plus colleagues who work with co-op. And actually, it's really important for us to hear from them and understand their perspectives. We've also done quite a bit of work as a team to reach out to expert audiences as well to help us understand sort of where we might prioritise and um, have the most traction. Because I guess one of the issues for us is almost understanding what do we pick from? What do we prioritise? We, we, we talked a bit about that in our paper um, because we have um we have an embarrassment of riches that we could go after and actually um the risk is then you know you're at the risk of not prioritizing enough so yeah we have seen we have seen challenges around that and there will be you know sometimes there's a little bit of friction or difference as well between what um different parties feel we should be prioritizing so the customer lens is often quite different 
um, to some of those other audiences. So we've had challenges around, around that within our organisation. Kate, over to you. I'm sure that's not not news to you either. No, no, not at all. And I, th I think one, and I'm just reflecting on what Didier was mentioning about that kind of prompted versus unprompted and trying to really explore and get the most out of a lot of the verbatim analysis that we have. So that's something I think we're focusing on a lot internally in terms of really exploring and kind of, you know, understanding the language that that customers are using um, we've also used some some um, external kind of social media um, analysis as well it's that fascinating mix between what they talk to you about directly versus what they talk about when you're not in the room um, and particularly you know employ you know approaching that employing those frameworks that understanding kind of putting it in the context and and really trying to explore you know what you're trying to get out of that and structuring it so huge amount of work and we've fortunately found some some really good partners in that area kind of trawling through <laughs> a lot of the data out there but again each of the it's all in a different context it's all with a slightly different group of people and you've, you've got to be looking across that triangulating that working out what that really means for you as an organization and and applying the judgment to it so um so yeah really really challenging and and just huge as i think that's that um, embarrassment of riches that that sarah mentioned that you know, we've got tons and tons of of this kind of data um and you've really got to, to work at getting the value out of it i think and, and using it appropriately I'd be interested to know one of the things that came out uh, another this was more anecdotal in, in, in our research was that um, there was a, a feeling amongst quite a few organizations, again, regardless of size, that that the whole sort of the last two years, um, both COVID, but also, you know, the sort of Black Lives Matter movement or the sort of, you know, the the, the um, renaissance of that movement in in 2020 has kind of there, there's definitely a feeling that that customers are looking for brands with purpose you know there's a sort of renewed um interest in in and w w you know that we all i think we all experience that on a daily basis um and what some people said um uh, in the research was that actually it had kind of reactivated and reset the organization a bit to give them a new renewed focus internally to really kind of um, ask themselves, you know, what it, do we have a purpose, and are we measuring it, and are we doing, and is it is it is it sort of linked to our our long term objectives? And there was a sort of resetting of that whole agenda, which obviously has been around for for you know a few decades, if not longer, but but really refocused the sort of senior team on brand purpose and and obviously the outcomes. Does that has that happened within? Uh, either the co-op RBS or DDA is it something you've heard heard you know from from your customers um, again in the spirit of doing this as a zoom thing I'll, I'll, I'll come to you first Sarah um, I think for us as an organization it's top of mind for all of our leaders I mean in that sense we're probably pretty lucky um, because it's it, it's it's baked into our business model um, in lots of respects because we are a co-op. I guess our members value what we stand for, and that's you know that's a core part of our governance, our accountability. Um, so it is really important um, to us and is always on the agenda um, alongside you know all of the other objectives that we need to meet around commerciality. Um, I don't think we've necessarily seen a step change from c customers um, since the pandemic. I think there was a moment in time where it was more top of mind. Um, and that, I think that's, to be honest, has ebbed away. Um, we'd like to think it was always there and it is important, but you know, when you're choosing what to buy on a convenience mission in a one of our stores on your way home from work or whatever, it's not necessarily the first thing that you're thinking about. We know, but we also know it's really important for us in bringing in new members. So, for example, we generally, our member base is a little bit older in terms of demographic skews, and we know that these things are really important to younger consumers. And we are working really hard to raise awareness of what we do amongst, for example, student populations, younger people to bring in the members of the future. So, um, I guess it's always there, um, mm. 
is it always top priority for every audience that we deal with? No, but it's always on the agenda in our yeah. organisation. Well, we 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 did. Um, there there was some uh, quite a lot of, of feedback saying that um, even if it had even in the well established brands that had already had strong sort of sense of 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 or had communicated strong sense of purpose, that it perhaps had um, been. Uh, disseminated to fur further reaching parts of the organization and, and perhaps more of the customer touch points were more aware of how you know their activities would impact on the overall understanding of the, the organization's purpose so perhaps it's more of a for some organizations it's how it's um you know been sort of communicated internally and measured internally um uh, kate any thoughts on that yeah, so I think, I think, and we've obviously been starting in quite a different place, I would say, than, than the co-op, having, having a, you know, a somewhat challenging reputation, I would say, in this space. I think, you know, they're, they're definitely, you know, there is a really, really strong commitment among the leadership team, among Alice and Rose. There's been, there's been, you know, a lot of work done, I think, to really embed this kind of top down and throughout. And I think for me that, that you know, personally, that really matters because, you know, I'm, I've done public sector roles before you want to feel good about where you work and when you work for a bank <laughs> you know you've got to understand why why you know, that has to be embedded in in that approach that you take and you know historically it's like well banks make money it's like well yes they do however you know there are so many other ways in which we support customers contribute to society and actually you know for all of our staff to feel that to be motivated by that to feel that they are making a difference that's incredibly powerful and I think what that that kind of internal dialogue and communication has done on purpose is really embedded that there's been a lot of work sharing examples you know kind of working through different scenarios um you know even some very challenging decisions you, you put it through that lens and say how do how can we demonstrate that this is aligned with our purpose um, and make sure that you know we're true to that and, and we're applying applying that to everything we're doing um so i think and that that you know, frankly i think in terms of motivation retention you know keeping mm -hmm. the right staff for the right reasons and then that translating through to frontline service behaviors it, it's really really critical i think didier i'm going to i'm going to ask if you want to respond to that but also i'm going to kind of wrap it up because i think we're we're uh, wrap it up into the next question which i think we're we're almost touching on in fact sarah sarah did which is that we're obviously all experiencing uh, the cost of living crisis it's really you know it's 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 very visceral uh now it's no longer a sort of uh, something we're, we're talking about it's something people are feeling um uh, how do we um i guess the 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 question is how what what sort of real-time data how how can we really see the shift in mood and sentiment in terms of when we're measuring purpose versus you know, uh, just as Sarah alluded to, um, you know, the crunch points whereby people are making decisions around purchasing, purchasing products. Uh, it, it, it have is there going to be? Do you anticipate, or have we seen across any of your organisations or your clients, DDA, a sort of uh, a, a reprioritizing of price over purpose, for example? Um, I would say yes and no. So the cost of living crisis will will obviously have everybody look at price and how how can we help. But when it comes to purpose, um, where where all of those changes and we we've all seen ourselves that society has accelerated into something where you say we're, we're moving to something else, and we've we've um, focused in this conversation on the positive aspects of um, purpose. But a lot of the organizations I have the pleasure to work with, they're also terrified. There's a very healthy dose of fear to end up on the wrong side of brand purpose. And we've seen a lot of um, very famous, even food brands. It, it doesn't have to be categories where you would already say they're predisposed to maybe not have as glorious a purpose. They had to repurpose brands because they are at the fear of... Um, the public opinion and the sentiment actually going against them, which is going to result in a far bigger crisis because it would effectively mean consumers turning away from the brand, but also consumers not purchasing all the way to the point of setting up ways to try to boycott the brand. And there, there is an increased importance um, in we would love to do the right thing, 
But if anything, can we put in some safeguards to never end up like what that organization ended up with by doing something that was intentionally very pure, but it was um, intercepted and it was then subsequently interpreted as something very bad. Mm -hmm. So there is a the purpose is a good thing, um, but it's also a dangerous thing because if you get it wrong, it has such an emotive reaction on a population that's already feels we've, we've rolled from one crisis into the next, that if you set a foot wrong, they may disproportionately punish you as an organization or a brand for doing so. And those are conversations that have put this right top of mind um, together with the, the cost of living and the pricing of, of such brands. So that, that, that those risk levels you've mentioned are actually probably heightened uh, as, as we move into uh, an environment where people are, are, are stretched. Um, the, the, presumably, the risk goes up for, for getting make, for, for making a wrong a misstep in terms of your 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 how your purposes communicate. Is that fair to say? Do you think it, it is very fair to say? Um, we we um, and anybody who looks at news, social media, etc., sees this polarization, and uh, you can very quickly have a group that is quite vocal and um, by, by no reason of bad luck, um, upset or touch a point with, with your brand that was considered to be totally inappropriate to the point of you need to be cancelled. And um, th there is a heightened awareness in organizations where they say, how can we make sure that when we are trying to channel our brand purpose, that we hit the right notes, the positive notes, and we don't end up overstepping our boundaries and then getting a backlash where people say, oh, hang on, we, we can see what you're trying to do and we're not buying it. And as a result, therefore, we're going to expose you. So that, that's a real heightened risk that is perceived amongst most of the brands that um, I work with. Sarah, did you want to come in on that? I, I noticed you came off mute, so I was wondering. I did. Yeah, I did. I think that's a really interesting point, actually, around um, the risk and also just being really cautious um, around it and the reality, the the commercial reality of all of this. Um, one thing I was just going to pick up on on cost of living that we have been discussing internally is we know all the things that sit underneath our brand purpose are really important we know they're important to society they're important to our customers as i said before you know do they trump price probably not but one of the things we have been discussing is sort of what does you know almost what does value mean and what does that look like um because these things are a really important part of um how we understand value as consumers so i think that's just it was just a build really because as we face into cost of living particularly in grocery you know it's a really competitive market anyway um so that's a really important thing for us to be mindful of so it's interesting this this risk point because obviously we're talking about risk from the perspective of, of companies and brands but i think one thing that we absolutely saw through covid and i think we're going to see again now through the cost of living pro, um kind of challenge is 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 the cost you know customers consumers being you know, far more risk averse you know they don't want to take risks they can't risk it they haven't got that leeway in their finances and I think that's where those really established kind of you know traditional brand relationships come to the fore because you know the trust that that organization is acting in your best interest is going to support you through more difficult sort of circumstances um, and affordability challenges not being able to pay things back um, I think that becomes you know, really, really critical. And that's something that, you know, yes, people are factoring rates and price, but they're also factoring in, you know, how can I trust that this organisation is, is going to work with me if I have got problems, if I can't pay? Um, so th I think there's a there's a real shift, I think, versus you know, some of the, the kind of behaviours and, and take, I guess take up of some, you know, not riskier brands, but different brands, new brands um and i think you know, certainly sarah i guess in your case and and in my case you know we we have branches and stores with staff there you know there are people that they can physically go and speak to and you know it's in this type of situation where that just becomes even more important that they can actually engage with a person that that person has got to understand the challenges understand what they're going through and help them put a, put a plan in place to, to to kind of address that and get out of that situation so i think you know, just really important 
you know, the, the importance of that, those relationships and that brand trust, I think is going to be key. That's a very, that's a very nice way uh, of, of tying that up. Because again, that goes back to this sort of end to end, you know, across the organization, every individual understanding and being buying in internally to that purpose so that then when they do come into contact with customers or, or anyone that they can sort of articulate it and, and, and empathize uh, in a way that, that their organization would expect them to. So it's, it's, it feels like it's as much an internal um, initiative there in, the, in those instances to make sure that all your staff are kind of equipped to, to communicate in that way and make sure um yeah okay so great good stuff well I'll stop um uh, whittering on there we're, we're, we're kind of coming to the end so what I thought we could do is just sort of to summer or well, maybe not even summarize but very briefly if each of you could kind of look ahead I mean I know it's impossible to look ahead it's probably the most stupid thing to ask you to do to look ahead over the next 12 months but um you know what are what, what do you see that the challenges I mean, we've touched on them already, the challenges coming down the line in terms of particularly measuring brand purpose and, and making sure it, it, it leads to both, um, the, you know, the, the, the ultimate growth of the organisation, but also the societal impact we've sort of talked about at the start. Where, where do you think the challenges for your roles and your departments are going to be over the next year, longer, shorter? Can I start with you, Um Sarah, what do you what what where where are you going to be focusing your attention? Um, so there's an ongoing conversation internally about um, obviously need is greater than ever. You know we donate a portion of our profits to supporting local communities. Um, how do we prioritise some of that? And also it goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning is how do we really understand the impact of that when it can take a long time and. Um, there's a whole programme of work going on that is just rolling on about us trying to get better at doing that. And I think we do a good job already, but actually how do we um, finesse that? And it's not straightforward. It's not easy. And to Kate's point earlier, it involves bringing in different knowledge, skills, expertise. Um, so we'll be working with different partners over the next 12 months and beyond to try and unravel some of that. But I don't think it's a different challenge. I just think the the context it sits in um, is going to change a lot. Um, probably yeah. even now, while we've been on this call, who knows what's happened? Well, we can all check yes, absolutely. After this, can't we? This, this is well, exactly. Few, yeah. <laughs> you you hear things pinging in the background and yeah. think, "Oh God, is that you know is sort yeah. of you know what what news is going to come next?" Didier, yeah. um, sorry, to, to, from your side clients concerns challenges we've talked about quite a few is there anything in particular you you'd flag so, yes if i if i would if i would look ahead we we've always we're all very familiar as marketeers with the five p's of marketing i think we're moving to six p's where purpose is going to become not something that's nice to do or nice to have but it's going to be a must-have to be successful as a brand it's not something consumers will see as separate i mean i always say try to sell any product that has been produced with animal cruelty and it will be a very hard sell so we see that it's starting to enter mainstream and i think that that trend will continue the question now is how how will the organizations that i work with amongst everything they have to deal with be able to set aside enough funding and attention to take on this challenge before it's too late. Okay, that, that's fairly uh, somber, somber words. Yes, um, I know we all keep late. smiling. We're like, we keep smiling, <laughs> it's all gonna be okay, right? And, and it is, I think I was, I think some of the points that Sarah made there about the, the measurement piece as well, because I, I, you know, for me, measuring is, is probably the biggest challenge here because, you know, historically, you look at your tracking data, you know, it just stays like that, really, unless anything big happens. And then look at the last few years. It's like, you know, COVID, then cost of living, pound crap, you know, it just feels like there are just, we're lurching from one crisis to the next. And with that context, your data is all over the place. So understanding actually what's driving that and what your role in is it is isn't it and and how you actually deliver on what you're trying to do I, th I think what you do have to 
keep doing is kind of bringing it back you know okay things are moving this is going in that direction this game but actually what are we trying to do and how can we how can we evidence that we are actually you know gaining traction on that and and you know and kind of you know Gr you know, growth has got to be sustainable growth it's got to be ethical growth and i think that's the key it isn't growth at the expense of everything else and at the expense of negative impact on customers it's got to be sustainable um so i think it, it's having the right objectives as well for your for your business for your customers that are realistic that that, that you can support that align with you know the pur purpose aligns um, so yeah, I, I think um, it has been an incredibly challenging few years, and I, that just feels like it's just going to continue, and we're just going to have to keep rolling with those challenges and, and smiling through. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, thanks, Kate. I think uh, I, we we know we've got a, a, a tough tough times ahead of us. Um, I, I will direct to people watching this um as well as saying thank you to, to kate reeve sarah deco and didier rocar i will also uh do one last plug of the, the special report that's actually goes into a lot of these issues we've talked about uh in, in some detail and, and does have more um exploration the findings from the research we've 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 mentioned as well that's the impact magazine special report and which will also be on the home page of research live if you go and look at the website now It'll be up there uh, on the on the homepage. You can get it for free. So um, thank you, Sarah, Kate and Didier. Really appreciate it. It's been a great discussion. We've covered a lot of ground and um, good luck over the next 12 months. Thanks for joining me. Hi. Hi, both. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Hi, Tim. Good, thank you. What a riveting conversation. I was literally hanging on pretty much every word. And I, I wanted to pick up on this idea of risk and political risk, because I think it would be remiss not to try and tackle that through through the course of today. And, you know, I mean, historically, companies have steered away from taking political stances because the center ground moves so damn quickly. Uh, the public are fickle. Um, and in some respects, companies aren't necessarily well equipped to manage political risks. So I think about even something yeah. like Meta, Facebook, you know, on the one hand, you can say there, there are, you know, if you're uh, suppressing uh, conversations around childhood self harm, tick good if you're uh suppressing conversations around hunter biden hmm, some good some bad i mean if you've got paypal stopping terror you know payments to terrorist organizations tick good uh political affiliations hmm, yeah maybe good maybe bad. so the point is how well equipped do you feel companies are to actually manage that political risk uh which inevitably comes up when you're when you're dealing with brand brand purpose and corporate purpose that yeah that's that's a challenging one i mean it, it, it's interesting and i i guess i've kind of i used to work in the financial sector a long time ago so i worked for abbey national back before they became santander so i kind of know what it was like working in a bank then um, and then three years I came back into the financial sector, having been out of it for, for a fair chunk of time. I won't, be, I won't say exactly how long, um, but it, it's, you know, it is very different. I think the way that, you know, some of the those risks and the regulatory kind of environment has been embedded into how we operate. Um, I mean, it does mean there is a huge amount of training that you have to plow through, but actually you start to grasp why that matters. Because, you know, each, you know, even kind of how you assess, you know, the customers, the, the clients that we're dealing with, the criteria for, you know, onboarding and managing those clients, it's all kind of part and parcel of, of literally how you work day to day. So actually, when, you know, some of the, the kind of sanctions crisis around um, Russia, yeah. for example, you think, oh, my gosh, what does that mean for us? And actually, when you went work through, because actually you're already on top of it, you're already taking the steps, you've already been disengaging from the, those high risk clients and relationships. Um, 
there, there wasn't actually that much at the at, at that kind of level. Um, and I think it, what it's really brought home to me is just the impact that that some of that regulatory change has had over time. And it's quite interesting. I used to work for a regulator, so in the in, in the media sector, and. Um, you know, some of this stuff, you're like, oh, God, it's such a nightmare. I've got to do all this and there's a process around this and there's a nightmare. But actually, those type of situations bring it home why the, that boring stuff matters, because it's yeah. so important that you are absolutely doing everything by the book and that you're identifying and you're on top of those risks. And if the risk is there, you are making that assessed decision that that is acceptable and within those boundaries. So, sorry, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> you know, waffling on. <laughs> no, it's a tough. It's a it's a tough question, and then I think the kind of regulations that you're talking about. I mean, I guess one 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 sort of follow up to that is: Are the agencies you work with as well informed, unconscious, and, and and equipped? Because I mean, almost anyone, I won't say almost anyone, but a lot of people can put messages out there. And obviously Unilever is a good example with Ben and Jerry's where there's just been this like battle between what Ben and Jerry's are putting putting out in terms of messaging and what, what HQ wants. You probably wouldn't face that kind of challenge within financial services, but it must be tough. Yeah, and I, and I think some of, I mean, some of that comes again down to the process stuff of how supplies are selected, but I think it is also that point around you know, and I think you know, this is something I think that was missing in the past was the, you know, the, the scrutiny, the challenge, the debate. Not only is that compliant, but actually is it in the spirit of, you know, yeah. and, and kind of kicking that around and making sure that, you know, you are you are formally ticking the boxes, but you're also pushing the boundaries of, of where that lies. And, and, and again, the, the, the testing, you know, the, you know, how that's researched, how that's tested, yeah. not just, you know, what a lawyer might take or, or a kind of perspective on it, but, but a customer's view on how that fits with, you know, that criteria, that regulation that, you know, and that that's really critical because it's how you interpret the rules some yeah. of the time. And actually it's not necessarily about, what we think, how the, how we think those rules should should apply, but yeah. it's also what customers think about that and what the consumer perspective is. Great. And Joe, what's what's on your mind? What are you thinking? Yeah, no, I was I just absolutely agree with what Kate said and just just build on it. I think for me, um, it's about starting with being clear on what you stand for and what is your position on that risk. So if you've got that kind of clarity of your purpose, then you you can face into it with that in mind then it's absolutely about understanding that consumer sentiment and, and the zeitgeist out there and having your finger on the pulse so that you you aren't going into that conversation or that issue blindly. Uh, and then I guess lastly, I, it would, for me would be about having decision-making frameworks in place. And yeah. so um, are you, when you're facing into that particular risk, are you taking all of these things into account in the proper manner to influence your decision? Uh, and then ultimately communicating that to your agency partners as well so that you're all singing from the same hymn sheet on it. That would just be my, my goals. Yeah, great. Look, thank, thank you for that. I mean, we are, we are out of time, but I think it's a really important topic, actually. And uh, it is a difficult one. And I don't think there are necessarily any right, right or wrong answers. So thank you for... Uh, sharing your perspectives on managing managing political risk in an age of purpose. That's quite important.